If you have a Bible or a way to access your Bible, we're going to be in the Gospel of John today, the 20th chapter, John chapter 20, and so find your way to verse 24. We're talking today about certainty. We'll be talking about the different challenges that we face to have a new beginning in our life. Uh, by the way, I just want to say thank you to anybody this week who kind of heard the challenge last Sunday of, call it the two and a half second challenge, the three second challenge, to just say to somebody, hey, would you like to come to church with me this Sunday? I got a lot of emails and texts, and everybody communicates with me now through Facebook Messenger, so, and you're welcome to do that as well, and just, I heard some really great stories of some people who just, they, had the, they took the opportunity to just invite somebody to come to church, and it became this really, really neat experience, so I encourage you to, to think about doing that as well. Uh, our, as we talk about each of these challenges, we've been talking about how when we go back to that story in, in the Bible, the story of the resurrection, the Easter story, that everything had changed. I mean, this was a tremendous new beginning. But not everybody understood what had take, was taking place. And there were some challenges, and we're looking at each one of these in the wake of the resurrection of Jesus in order for the people who would believe in Jesus to experience this new beginning. What, what it would take for them to have a breakthrough is that they'd have to deal with these challenges. And so today we're talking about the challenge of certainty. My mom used to say there are only two things certain in life. Death and taxes, yep, everybody knows those. Y'all have the same mom that I did, apparently. <laughs> We've all heard that before, right? In fact, I was thinking about that this week because uh, it's that old story, you know, about the guy that was needing a little bit of certainty. He was, he was, he was uh, fishing off the coast of the Florida Keys, and his boat capsized not too far from the shore. But he was holding on for dear life because he was naturally afraid of what's in the water. Now, there's some, some gators and so he was looking everywhere for the gators, not wanting to let go of the, of, the, of the capsized boat. And he saw a beachcomber, a guy walking down the beach, and he yelled out. He said, are there any gators in, in the water? And the, and the guy said, no, there hadn't been any for years. The guy was kind of relieved. You know, he let go of the boat. He started swimming leisurely for the shore, and he yelled out to the guy. He says, well, what happened to the gators? And the guy from the shore yelled back, the sharks got them. <laughs> <laughs> well, just the moment when we've let go of one fear in life, uh, to find some new certainty, we discover that that certainty never comes. And one of the things that we have to do when it comes with the story of the resurrection is we've got to deal with the, the issue of our need for certainty in life. And the man that we meet in this story is the person that we all know for his problem with believing in the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, his, his name is doubting Thomas. He's known for one reason. That is, he didn't have certainty about the resurrection. He said unless he can put his hands where the nail marks were. Let's read his account in John chapter 20, verse 24. Now, the disciples have all seen Jesus except for one guy. Verse 24. Now, Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples. He's also known as Didymus, it says. He was not with the disciples when Jesus came, and so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. By the way, just imagine being Thomas for a moment, right? You come back from wherever you're going, and, you're, and you, you've been doing something, and you come back, and, you're, and they're all like, we saw Jesus. Guess who we saw today, you know? We saw Jesus. Talk about feeling, being felt, feeling like you've left out. We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, and this is, this is his famous line, unless I see the nail marks, in his hands. Why? Because that's how they nailed him to the cross, right? And put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Look at all those ands. Unless I see, unless I put my hands, I will not believe. He needs certainty. A week later, verse 26 tells us, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. And then he says this, stop doubting and believe. There's no recorded reaction of Thomas. 
There, there's no story about how Thomas was like, yeah, he was checking out his hands, he was checking out his side. It's just this immediate response. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Certainty evaporated, didn't it, for him? My Lord and my God. And Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. He's talking about us there. All through our lives, all throughout Christian history, there have been people who've wanted to experience what Thomas, and they said, unless I can have that absolute proof, I'm not going to believe. But certainty, if we, were, if we place that requirement of certainty, we will never have that new beginning. Jesus is probably not going to appear to you today and go, look, here's my hands, here's my side. In fact, what he says is, is we're blessed if we believe without the need for that certainty, without the requirement of that certainty. This morning, I want to just sort of break this down for us because I think this is a really important point for all of us who are Christians, but maybe if you're going to share your faith with somebody who's not a Christian, you're going to be getting some of these questions. Like, how do I know? Like, how can I really know? I, I want to be a Christian, but how can I really know that Jesus really rose from the dead? I need certainty before I'm willing to let go of the boat. <laughs> well, here's some things I want you to keep in mind about the resurrection. One of them is this. The resurrection as an event is not contingent on seeing it. Do you actually know that no one ever saw the resurrection? Nobody was there when it happened. It's kind of an interesting thing. There, are, there is actually no one who ever saw the actual resurrection of Jesus. They only saw Jesus. He was dead, he was in a grave, and then they don't see it, and then he's alive. And they concluded something based on that, which was pretty obvious. But there are people who will say to us, and maybe you're struggling with this in your own faith journey today, in which you're sort of saying, you know what, I want to believe in the resurrection of Jesus but I just, I need more certainty. I need more proof. How do I, how can I really know that it happened? But you know, we don't apply this same principle to a lot of things in our life. We don't apply this to say figures in history. I'll give you an example. Like how many of you believe in George Washington? All right, anybody here is like George Washington did not live. I absolutely refuse. I am a George Washington atheist, you know? <laughs> Or I'm just not sure if there was really a George Washington or not. I'm really in the crisis about that. I've never met anybody with real, like, great uncertainty about George Washington. But let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever seen George Washington in person? Anybody? <laughs> I mean, you say, well, I'm pretty old, but I'm, you know, I'm not that old. you know. In fact, there's no one alive today who's actually ever seen George Washington. So how do we know he lived? Well, this is not a question of science, this is a question of history. And history has different methods and measurements than science does. Science does observation, science requires sight, but history requires evidence. And you can corroborate evidence, you can see Washington's writings, you can read other historical things of the time that talk about him. You can look at one of George Washington's letters, you can go sit in George Washington's chair, there's even George Washington's bathroom. You know, everything you can relive about George Washington's life based on historical evidence. Well, what evidence is there of the resurrection of Jesus? Well, Jesus was a nobody in the first century world. Nobody knew who he was. But it's interesting that history does recount him, secular history as well as religious history. And Jesus is actually one of the most noted historical figures of all antiquity. It's really a fascinating thing. When you begin to look at the historical evidence of Jesus, he's a well-known figure in history. But what about the resurrection itself? I want to just show you, this is, I'm not going to give you the big lecture today. I just want to give you a few things to kind of think about as we think about the evidence of the resurrection. Here's just four real simple things. One thing is this, it's the empty tomb itself. The fact that the tomb was empty requires us to explain how. And every few Easter's or so, I'll go through and recount all of the different parts of this. But if you really want to just kind of stop and think about, like, how did the tomb get empty? The people who first came to the tomb, they didn't know how it got empty. Mary Magdalene was like, where is the body of Jesus? Did somebody take him? And then you start thinking about who would have taken them and how. 
The Jewish people couldn't have done it because of the Jewish laws about traveling on the Sabbath. And the Romans wouldn't have done it. They had placed guards there and sealed the tomb. Jesus' own disciples didn't do it because they didn't know what was going on. So how did the tomb of Jesus get empty? And as you work through all the evidence as a historian, one of the things that true historians of this period have said is there is no reasonable explanation for how the tomb of Jesus got em- empty apart from some sort of a miracle. The, this, is, this, is a, this is actually a fact and, it's, been, and, and it's, it's so well established in the historical circles of scholarship that, that people who don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus have had to back up and say he must have never been buried. In a few weeks, I'm going to get on an airplane. I'm going to fly to Denver. Every year I go to this meeting. It's in a different city. But it's a gathering of all the leading academics in the whole world, folks from every major university in the world, religious academics, the Society of Biblical Literature, the American Academy of Religion, the Institute of Biblical Research, just every single group, the American Society of Religion, the Evangelical Theological Society. And all these different academics will be there, and some of them are all across the faith spectrum, and some of them don't believe. There's a group called the Westar Institute, and they formed something years ago called the Jesus Seminar, and they were all over television. And these guys were, are radical. They don't believe in anything, any miracles in the New Testament. And they say Jesus was never raised from the dead. And one of those guys is John Dominic Crossan. And Crossan has written a lot of books. You can see his books at any Barnes and Nobles anywhere. But, but Crossan has said, because he knows he can't explain away the empty tomb, he therefore says, well, Jesus was never buried. He died on the cross, and they just left him there. And if you ask Crossan, well, what'd they do with Jesus? And he says, he must have just been you know, eaten by, by dogs. But that's, that's his conclusion. Because the evidence is so overwhelming, people who doubt it have to go back. Here's another piece of evidence. It's the people who, who, who are identified in the gospel as the eyewitnesses. Who are the eyewitnesses of it? They're women. Now, if you, the, the West Star folks, the Jesus Seminar folks, what they also say is, is that these gospel stories are legendary, fictional works that were sort of, they they sort of created the stories. But if you are making up an account of the resurrection, you never would have made these women the eyewitnesses. They didn't live in our world. In that world of the first century, there were a, a criteria that had been established for what could be a legal witness in a court of law. A witness had to be a person who was upstanding citizen, known in society. People that didn't qualify were slaves, and people that were foreigners, and people that were of the entire gender of women were excluded as legal witnesses. Therefore, if you were, if you were making this story up, and you were going to tell, like, this is what happened, and this is how Jesus came back from it, you would have never invented this. Scholars who've studied this have come away with an overwhelming conclusion that the only logical explanation for ever telling the story from the ancient standards of the world is because this is what actually happened. Because who are some of the witnesses? One of them was a woman named Mary Magdalene. Not exactly a person of high moral standards in the ancient society. So these are the kinds of evidences, but there's more. Here's another example of a kind of evidence that points to the resurrection. It's the conversion of doubters, right? It's people who had once said, I don't believe and I'm not willing to give testimony to my faith. You have a guy like Peter hiding out in an upper room in one moment. A few days later, you have a Peter standing up at Jerusalem telling everybody that he'd been raised from the dead, being thrown in jail for it, being beaten for it, being persecuted for it. You have a a guy like Thomas who doesn't believe and then he believes. You have a guy like Paul It goes from persecuting Christians to after he sees Jesus to preaching Christ to the ends of the world. The the conversion of these people points to something. They must have seen something. They must have experienced something. Something must have happened on that Sunday. Now here's the, the fourth one, and we could go through a long list of others, but the expansion of early Christianity. How many Christians were there in 20 AD, would you guess? Just throw out a number. How about the number zero? (laughs) How many Christians are there by the end of the first century? The answer is there are tens of thousands of Christians. 
How many by the end of the second century? Hundreds of thousands. How many by the end of the third century? There are millions. In fact, by the end of the third century, the Roman Empire becomes an official, its official religion becomes Christianity. How does this backwater Jew from from Nazareth and Galilee become the leader of a religion that absolutely encapsulates the entire known world. Something must have happened on that Sunday morning 2,000 years ago. So as you begin to, be, begin to look at those kind of historical pieces, you begin to see that there is genuine evidence of the resurrection, and it's not just contingent on our certainty of seeing it. Here's the other thing. It's not contingent on our believing it. He said, well, why would you say that? Well, every once in a while, somebody will say something like this. They'll say, I have to see it to believe it. That's what Thomas says. But there are some things that happen, and whether or not you see it or believe in it, it's still true. There are some things that are, that are true, whether or not you personally believe it. You say, well, I, I don't personally believe in it. That doesn't determine whether or not it happens. And so I want to put this uh, maybe in another way. Be careful putting a condition on faith. That's what Thomas does, isn't it? He says, I will not believe until I have certainty. Now, that's the opposite of faith, actually. In the book of Hebrews, we've been reading that Hebrews 11 passage. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. That real faith, real faith is the confidence in a God that we can't see. Real faith is a confidence in a Christ who we don't get to see his hands. We don't get to see the nail marks. Hudson Taylor was a missionary, and he, he gave, I think, a great quote about faith. He said, now, it's not a great faith that we need, but it's a faith in a great God. I was thinking about it, you know, how could I explain this? So here's another analogy. How about math? Everybody loves math. Here's a really complicated math problem. What is any number times zero equal? And you guys really know math. Any number times zero equals zero. That's a picture of faith. If you have a zero faith, it doesn't matter how many miracles you see. It doesn't matter how much certainty you get in life, the net outcome will be zero. But if you have even the tiniest bit of faith, what is any real number times infinity? It's infinity. I can remember being in, in, in algebra class in high school and going, wait a minute, teacher, you're telling me that .0000001 times infinity equals infinity? And she's looking at me, shaking her head, going, yeah. I'm like, man, that's crazy. You're telling me that a God like ours, if he's big enough, can take even the tiniest bit of faith and do infinitely with it? Yeah, he told a story about that one time. He said, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, which is about that big, you can move a mountain. Faith, God can work with a little bit of faith. God can't work with no faith. Be careful putting a condition on faith. Philip Yancey wants to describe faith as believing in advance what only makes sense in reverse. We don't have the benefit of hindsight with faith. We have to trust God and, and leave the outcome to Him. Now, there's an example in the Bible, famous example of a guy who put a huge condition on faith. And the example that I, I, I'm thinking of right here is that of Gideon. Remember Gideon in the Old Testament? Gideon's fleece. Gideon is in the Old Testament book of Judges. By the way, if you haven't been reading your Bible lately, go home and read Judges. It's really one of the best parts of the Bible to read. It's fantastic. Lots of, lots of battles and violence. You know, it's, it's, really, it's, it's really good. It's really good. I mean, somebody needs to make a movie out of it. But there's a story in, in, about a guy named Gideon. If you don't know this, and Gideon, God says to Gideon, I want you to lead the army, save the nation. Gideon's kind of like, well, I think it might be you, God, talking to me, but I've got to know for sure. I've got to have certainty. This is what he says, Judges chapter 6, verse 36. Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you've promised, look, I'll place a, a wool fleece on the threshing floor. 
If there's dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I'll know you saved Israel by my, that, that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. If the ground is all wet and the thing I put on it, it gets, is dry in the morning, I know, that, I know that you've called me. And Gideon's convinced and he goes and leads the army, right? If you know the story, you know that that's not what happens. What happens is, is God does exactly that, and the next day, you know what Gideon says? Hey, can you do that again? But can you do it in reverse? God, can you keep the ground dry and make the fleece wet this time? He, the, the need for certainty. And God's like, okay, fine, I'll do that. But faith does not require certainty. God didn't start being God the moment Gideon started believing in him. God was God before that, and God was making the promise before Gideon could even understand the promise. The resurrection is not contingent on me believing it or even seeing it. And in fact, this is Jesus' message to those disciples. If you believe it now, you will see it later. If we believe it now. We will see it later. Now, I was writing that down this week, just kind of you know, putting this outline together, and I was thinking, you know, that sounds a lot like somebody on TV or something, you know. Well, I believe it now and see it later. In fact, we have a little line for that. We said, well, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. But here is one example of something that sounds too good to be true, but it is true. Here's an example of something that sounds like, man, I want there to be a resurrection. I want there to be life after death. I want this. This sounds really good. It sounds too good to be true. In fact, the only way I could believe in it is if I had faith. <laughs> and that's what it takes, isn't it? I love what John said. John had seen Jesus, and he wrote not just this gospel, but a letter. And I want you to hear what he said in 1 John 3, 2. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. We don't know right now, we don't have certainty right now, but we know this. When He appears, we'll be like Him, for we will see Him as He is. What John is talking about there is this day where what happened to Jesus is going to happen to us. A day of resurrection. That what, he, what happened on Easter is, is what he's going to do in our lives. But there's a couple of like, metaphors, if you will, in the Bible to try to get us to, to understand a little bit about this. And I want you just to see these real quickly as we finish. The first one is the metaphor of a name in a book. The first time the Bible ever starts to talk about how God is going to raise people from the dead, like Jesus would be raised, is in Daniel chapter 12. It says in Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth, in other words, they're dead, will awake, that's resurrection, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. That passage is repeated all through the New Testament. Jesus talks about it in John 5. It's the final scene of the book of Revelation. God sits on His throne. He opens up the book. And it's like a... It's like a genealogy book or a registry book or a, a, a voting book, if you will. Is your name in there? Is your name on the list? And it goes through the names. Uh, yeah, but your name's on there and your name's on there. But it says in this passage that, it, that, that, that the requirement is that your name is found written in the book. That, that, that it's, it's, it's there, that it's been recorded and that when you rise in this moment, you rise either to this reward of life that never ends, or you rise to everlasting contempt. So let me ask you a question. Is your name in the book? I don't mean is your name in the registry of our church. I'd love for everybody to join our church, by the way, if I haven't said that already. 
I mean, is your name in the book? I, I don't mean, do I know who you are? Does somebody know who you are? I mean, does the God of heaven know who you are? Has he written your name in his book? Do you know that on that day that he will say, yep, your name is in the book? If it isn't, he tells us right here what's up for, what's up for grabs. Then he uses another metaphor. The Bible uses a metaphor of citizenship. We've been talking a lot about that these days. The metaphor of a citizen of a country. Paul uses that analogy in Philippians. Philippi was a Roman colony. And if you were lived in Philippi, which was in Greece, you were a citizen of a city in Italy called Rome. But he just starts talking about having a citizenship not in Rome or on earth. But in Philippians 3.20, he says, but our citizenship is is in heaven. We've got citizenship papers that say we belong up there. And then he makes this statement. He says, we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. There's coming a day, he says, When our bodies will be transformed. I read that passage at my grandfather's funeral. I loved my grandfather. Just I can't even tell you how much. But my grandfather and I had always had a one-way conversation. Because he couldn't hear. And I said, one day, one day, he's going to get new ears. He's going to finally get to hear me talk. And I'm going to do all the talking. Because he did a lot of it. (laughs) And my grandmother, who told me how great she was at basketball... She's going to get some new legs, and and I am going to beat her on the basketball court. (laughs) Now, she'll probably take me. You see what I'm saying? This resurrection stuff is about God putting it back together. This resurrection stuff is about new bodies and God's new world. But it does depend on, is your name in the book? I've been talking through this whole series about how important it is to just share our faith because around us, the city around us, the community around us, there are thousands and thousands of people who are not in church today who don't know Christ, many of them whose names are not in the book, and we're supposed to be helping them discover that. And I talked about that last Sunday in my sermon, and one one of my boys caught me Monday after school, and he said, Daddy, I want to tell you something. He said, I did what you said in the sermon. Now, when you're a preacher, by the way, you're not really sure exactly what that means, you know. I did what you said in the sermon. Like, I said a lot of things in the sermon. I hope you didn't do some of the things I'm thinking about. <laughs> so I was like, what did, what did you do? He said, I, I, I told one of the kids at school about Jesus. And I said, really? I'm like, tell me how you did it. He's like, well, he said, I, 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 one of my friends, he doesn't go to church. He doesn't believe in God. He he, he tells me all the time he's an atheist, and he said, I, I, started go, I started talking to him, I invited him to church, I started giving him the ABCs. If you, if you go to vacation Bible school, you know what the ABCs are, admit to God, believe in Jesus. He said, Daddy, I couldn't get through A, and he stopped me. And, he, and you could just see like he, it, the, the face of a, of a kid who so desperately wanted his friend to know Jesus, but then be, to be met with failure, to be met with resistance. And he's like, Daddy, I failed at it. I was like, no. No, I'm real proud of you right now, son. It's not up to you to make him believe. You don't have to make him believe. All you're doing is you're just telling the story. And it's up to him. It's not contingent on you. It's contingent on him. It's up to him to decide what he's going to do. No, daddy's real proud of you. That you took that, you took that and just shared your faith with him. I hope that all of us We'll take that challenge. Folks, there's people in our lives, their names are not in the book. Let's take that challenge.